Cool. I've got some questions there. Um, yeah, thanks very much for joining us, uh, albeit albeit virtually. Um, it's uh, challenging times, but um, yeah, it's good to uh, be able to present to you remotely. I'm just wondering if everyone can see um, our slideshow. Um, so I'm just going to really cover off on some of the sort of basic and fundamental stuff, I, I guess, of condor banks and waterways, but also, you know, keen to look at some real life problems that, that you might be experiencing and basically how to how to solve those problems. Um, and through some discussion, um, it's, um, I'll start off with basically the key points that we want to cover today are really around um, ground cover and how important that is the depth and the size of the contour banks and the channels uh, and what influence wheel tracks, for example, have on that. We're going to cover off on a bit of waterway maintenance and we'll see some real life examples of that. Um, contour bank channels and slopes. So, you know, what people are still marking out banks or what, what slope do we actually put in the channel um, to make it flow properly without eroding. Um, look at some soil type influence is something you should be considering uh, building banks, especially on pasture country. Um, and also a, a bit of the new technology for marking out banks. So if we look, if we go back to the reasons why we got the condor banks in the first place, it was really about, you know, what condor banks really do is, is stop little rills turning into massive gullies. Um, ultimately, ground cover is the key component of actually stopping erosion in the first place. But, you know, large volumes of water flying is obviously causing big, big problems when it comes to waterways. And so we'll, we'll cover off on that separately. But, you know, this, this is some work that was done many years ago, but it shows the, the sort of very good correlation between how much ground cover you got and how much water is going to run off uh, on, on an average annual rainfall. So, you know, with low ground cover, obviously a lot more water is running off because of lack of infiltration. And when we look at the next slide, this then directly correlates the amount of soil loss. So, you know, if we're forming soil at a few tonnes per hectare per year, you can see that anything um, upwards of a few tonnes is pretty much unsustainable. Um, and ground cover plays a very important role in that. And Whilst that's easy to say, it's not as always easy to do. And we've come to, as typical, you know, long dry spells are finished with a really big wet season. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite challenging. Um, the black squares, there are individual readings, uh, recordings, and then they fit a line to those, to the, uh, they're, they're sort of research trial plots, if you like. And the line is the, the relationship. So, if you look at um, when you start to get into the 30, 40% cover levels, that's where there's massive changes, you know, the massive reduction in, in the soil loss. Um, so yeah, the black dots are just each recording of a different trial over those years. So when we look at ground cover, and I think this is a pretty ordinary slide, but there's quite a few good resources now available uh, of, um, showing different ground covers, but you know, thirty percent cover, forty percent cover is really not that much in reality. Um, so every little bit helps. Um, obviously, we want to be never reducing below thirty percent, but it's just sometimes it happens. But yeah, you know, what I'm trying to point out is that you know, there's thirty percent isn't really that much cover, and it makes a huge difference. So the more, the better. And I think um, in all of our systems now, we're trying very actively to do that, but Sometimes we just can't achieve that all the time. Um, we did some work a few years back in the Highlands uh, looking at a, an old erosion scar and the black area circled there is where the erosion scar was and the rest of that is a yield map uh, from the he header. And we knew from old aerial photography that that erosion scar started in the 1960s. And if we, we, we worked out that that was costing about $50 a hectare a year in lost uh, yield. 
and over 30 years that you might be in the range of $1,500 a hectare yield loss just from that one erosion scar. So, you know, these things have long-term impacts and we need to uh, keep that in mind. This is just not short-term stuff. This is, can affect long-term productivity. So the first thing that we've got to do if you're starting to plan for uh, waterways, condor banks, is to get good data. Um, without good data, you're really guessing and the old way of doing things would be to start at one end and see where the bank ended up. I, I don't think we need to do that anymore. I think we've got enough tools uh, in front of us to actually make very good decisions about contour, and water, contour bank waterway positioning and entry and exit points before we even turn one sod of dirt. And there's three main ways that we can collect elevation data. And we need this elevation data to really help with that planning. Um, if you've got two centimeter GPS on your tractor, then you can use that. Uh, it's most systems are recording elevation as they're going, whether it's spraying or harvesting, planting or whatever. We prefer if you use your planting elevation readings because they're the most consistent and the narrowest generally, whereas a spray rig is gonna change in height as the, as the rig empties. So you get this variable sort of artificial difference in height. So just keep that in mind that normally we would have a 30 or 40 meter swath width in your country, um, but with the spray rig, you can get that differential height because the, the tank's emptying and the, and the rig lifts up. So probably seeding data or cultivating data is the best to use for planning. You can also use a thing called LIDAR. And in select areas of Queensland, there's been quite a bit of LIDAR work done. Um, the, every power line in Queensland is being mapped at the moment. Uh, it, does, it happens every year. But unfortunately, in a lot of areas, they're not very wide swaths. Um, but the middle picture there is actually a picture of LIDAR. Um, and yeah, what it's showing, it, it, it's picking up the ground, it's picking up every bit of trees, and it's picking up power lines. So LIDAR is, a, is an airborne laser scanning device that's flown over for flood modeling and for, um, um, you know, uh, the like power line sort of work. But the byproduct is that we get very, very good elevation data. So we can see the, the actual ground elevation. Um, they're measuring that to every square meter. So extremely accurate information where we can get it. A lot of the floodplains have been done, a lot of the towns have been done, and the, and the government's making this data freely available. It's just that it's not accessible everywhere. But we are at Neil Johansson's last week. It just so happens we looked at some, 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 seeing if there's any data, and sure enough, there was LIDAR data over the whole property. So it might exist, it might not, but it's freely available and we can process that. There's another way, with the advent of drones, a lot of drone companies are saying they can do full 3D modeling. So the picture on the right is from a, a 3D from a drone. Yes, you can get elevation from a drone, but you've got to keep in mind that it's not necessarily the ground. If you have a very big, it's done with what we call photogrammetry. So it's actually getting lots of photos of, of, um, of, of, of the surface and it, and it produces a 3D model of those photos. The problem is that if it's got lots of dense grass, then it's picking the top of the grass and not necessarily the ground. Whereas LIDAR is a laser, it's, it shoots through all the vegetation and hits the ground. And your tractor auto steer is actually obviously driving on the ground. So, you know, I would, I would not be looking for, you know, looking to use drone um, data, particularly uh, for planning for elevation uh, for contour banks, because you might be getting a false false reading because it's the vegetation. Um, we, we're doing some at the moment on a big flood erosion issue out here on the Darling Downs, simply because there's no other way of getting in here and uh, the LIDAR was gonna cost too much. So we're gonna use drones to get that data, keeping in mind that it's, it's not giving us the actual ground measurement necessarily. Um, once you've got that data, this is sort of what it looks like. Um, you can see here, the individual contour lines. Uh, I think they're every meter. Um, 
and the colors represent the height. So red's high and the blue down here is low. You can see the preferential flow path of the water, where the water would normally go. And if you do have contour banks in, then it would show up uh, changes to that flow. Um, what we've also done here is actually look at ponding areas in the, in the blue, the straight blue areas are actually where water's being held. So you can get all of this information from your tractor if you've got auto steer two centimeter. If you've got the uh, subscription service from satellite, then no, this is, it's not good enough. But if you've got the RTK two centimeter accurate, then that's that's the level we require. This this will give you maps like this. So this was pulled directly off a off a machine. So the data is really really good, um, and it's being collected all the time. And you, most people aren't even aware of it. So let us know if you have any yeah any data you you want processed. We can have a look at that. But you can see this is a really good way of planning for where to start and end contour bank, where to put a waterway, uh, where to do drainage. So it's a really, really important starting point. Um, in this case, we also cut some drains and, and this is what typically what a drain would look like. It's not so much soil erosion, but draining areas and just shallow drains at 0.1, just to remove ponded areas in the paddock makes life a lot easier to, to work those fields. Uh, to get access, spraying, etc., so we don't end up with big weed problems in the middle, and very quite cost effectively to do those types of things. Um, the other great thing about the new technology that we've got now is that you can actually use the same elevation data, and you'll see the one on the right there is a 3D model. The black lines or dots are actually where we actually where the farmer drove with his machine. And we can produce a full 3D model of that landscape, but also down on the bottom left is the actual predicted velocity. So we simulate a rainfall event on that country and look at where would the high risk areas be, and then simulate putting a contour bank in and seeing what inf impact that has on the on the um, on the velocity. So those red areas there actually line up beautifully with where the where the wash is actually occurring in that paddock, um, but you know, um, it's just another handy tool before you turn any soil to get an understanding of that field. And all this technology is commercially available, whether this is OptiSurface, but there's another one called Terracutter, which does similar sort of things. So there is technology available to do this type of work. Um, if you need to check your capacities of the Condor Bank channels, um, the good thing about going up and down the hill is that if you pull a line of data out of your tractor of, of the elevations and put it into Excel, which is what I've done here, um, if you need any help with this, I can certainly help. But you can now clearly see the capacity of those Condor Bank channels. So the old way of doing this was to get a level on staff and, and, and put that across the bank channel and, and put a ruler on it. But now we can actually got the luxury of just pulling data off the machine and you can see what capacity and overall these banks have got very good capacity nearly nearly three quarters of a meter at least and that's the sort of what i would recommend is the minimum amount sort of 60 or 70 centimeters of capacity from the top of the top of the condor bank there to the bottom of that channel is about 75 centimeters so really good capacity in those banks uh, which gives me confidence that it's you know it's it's gonna going to be uh, going to work pretty well um obviously anything less than 60 centimeters we've got to i think it's a general rule of thumb but i've done a lot of design work and you know most of the time that's about what you really need so just keep that in mind when you're building banks that um you this is settled height right so you've got to depending on how you build them you might, might need to build them a meter meter and 20 high to get them back to a 60 or 70 centimeter height settled so just keep that in mind but it's another good tool gps is another great tool for for checking things like bank height i talked a little bit about soil there soil type very important that you uh, consider things like dispersion now that's on the right hand side there you can 
clear, you can see there's a cloudiness around that soil particle. You just put a piece of soil in a, in a dish of water, a rainwater is preferable, and you see the reaction. After 20 minutes, if you're getting a cloudiness there, I'd be very careful about building condor banks and waterways because that's what's gonna happen when it rains, is you're gonna get this dispersion of your soil and it's caused by too much sodium. It's not salt, it's not salinity, it's sodicity. There's too much sodium in the clay and it's pushing those particles apart and they, they won't settle out again. And you can just imagine what that's gonna have impact wise. And this is more probably in grazing country than cropping country, but just keep that in mind. Simple test, cost you nothing. Uh, the stuff on the left is flaking. It's a different effect. You can see the, the, the particle has just fallen to pieces. That's not the same problem. It's a different problem. That's more of a natural thing and it's not, not, I wouldn't be worried about it. So dispersion is something you really got to look out for. You can test for this just by doing an exchangeable sodium percentage test, but um, this is a really cost effective, cheap and easy, easy way of doing assessment on your own place. Uh, I usually leave it about 20 minutes to see that impact. So particularly in your subsoils, obviously. Um, I guess we're trying to minimize things like this silt pan where, where we farming across the contours generally leads to this where it concentrates water in one spot and, 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 and goes down and puts a big lot of silt in one place. And you can see, I'll go to the next one. This is, I'm doing some surveying work there to look at this, but you can see all the silt fans every 50 meters there and each wet spot in the middle. So we're trying to minimize that sort of uh, scenario by keeping good cover in the first instance and farming up and down the hill to minimize that concentration like that because the capacity of this bank now is about a third of what it was before that silt channel, uh, silt fan went in there. So, you know, it makes a huge impact on the capacity of your condor banks if you don't um if we, we're trying to minimize these types of things i guess it's reasonably easy to fix this but um you know your capacity at the time and your weed control is is out out of control um we've been uh, as you know central queensland was the home the birthplace really of, of up and down slope farming we've been doing some stuff on the darling downs even a bit crazier than the stuff you've got up in cq but um, you know, typically two to three percent is what, what you'd normally do. Um, this is some work near Allora we were doing um, up and down the hill at six percent, but that's probably a bit extreme. Uh, what we're trying to do is just shed water like a, a tin roof where each row carries its own water. Wheel tracks are sort of a backup and they often get erosion in them if your water's not staying in individual rows. So that's the key thing about this whole system. It needs to be um, each row carrying its own water, but when you get disc seeders and things like that, uh, wide wide rows, that sometimes doesn't happen. So it's really important to you know, design your whole system with your machinery, your banks, and your waterways all all considered when you're doing that. I just wanted to have a look at a little bit about some questions came up in other workshops about you know, how does a land slope impact on the size of the contour bank channel and you can see here at a one percent slope which is probably below what i would put contour banks in anyway um, you know you've got this very big um, a covered area and, and not much of a nick point as we increase our land slope obviously more more and more of that channel is doing the work and you have more and more soil that needs to be cut away to form that form that bank so often we see at that nick point is where the erosion is occurring and um, it's quite challenging to manage because it's just that changing in grade that causes that. Um, but yeah, you can see here clearly the, the impact of slope on that capacity of that channel. Also want to look at the effect of depth of the condor bank on the cross-sectional area. So what is the capacity of that condor bank? And you can see here that going from 30 centimeters deep to 50 centimeters deep uh, dramatically changes the, the, the capacity of those, 
of those channels. Um, so it's it's like almost a three times increase on a two percent slope, which is typically what cent the central Queensland is dealing with. You know, you're you 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 increasing that capacity by threefold just by a twenty centimeter depth change. So and, and look at the impact on the the water area. It goes from seventeen meters to twenty eight meters. So you know the the depth is is everything and i think we we've not maintained our banks properly in, in most areas of central queensland and letting them settle down to that sort of number means that the capacity is reduced dramatically and i'm not sure if you're aware but most contour banks are designed for a one in 10 year rainfall event so if you've got a one in 12 year rainfall event these banks are going to not have any capacity and Typically, our rainfall has been changing, you know, dramatically over the last few years. So we're we're getting a lot more overtopping. So the combination of changing rainfall patterns, the design that the condor banks were done to, which is one in ten year event, and the re the reduction in the capacity because we're not maintaining them enough, means we're getting a lot more failures. Wheel tracks also play a role, and I'll jump onto that in a minute, but. You know, it's a combination of factors that are causing us to have a lot more bank failures in recent times. Um, but we are improving that, obviously, with reducing the amount of um, runoff that's coming with, with a lot more uh, stubble cover in our systems. But I'll show you something about how a stubble cover is also affecting this in a minute as well. So you've got to understand that these, these structures that we designed, you know, 30 or 40, 50 years ago, were designed for bare earth in the first instance. They were designed for a one in 10 year event um, and they didn't take into account any zero tool system. So we've dramatically changed the, the landscape that we're working in, which has led to more and more of these types of failures. This might take a little bit of get, getting your head around, but let's just step through it. On, on the bottom there, we have the contour bank uh, height. So, 10 centimetres, 20 centimetres, 30, 40, 50, 60 centimetres is the bank height in metres. Uh, if we look at the cross-sectional area, so how much capacity has that contour bank got? And you can see it's not a straight line, right? It's, it's, it's gradually increasing. As, like it says in the, in the yellow there, it says the curve gets steeper as it gets uh, more and more capacity. What that means really is if you have a 60 centimetre high condor bank, which is what most of you have got, and you put a 10 centimetre wheel track over that, so we're dropping from 60 centimetre capacity to 50 because the wheel track's driven over it, you can see our square metre capacity is dropped from 10 to 7. So like a 30% roughly reduction in the capacity of that condor bank because we put a wheel track over it. So again, that's why I said right at the start, we need to be building our banks bigger than what we expect. One for settlement, two for zero till, and three for wheel tracks going over those condor banks if you're going up and down the hill. If there's any questions on that, I'll, I'll keep moving. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, this is a bit of a complicated slide, but don't, don't, get, don't get hung up on that. What I want you to look at, is on there's three things there. Under Manning's N is the roughness coefficient. That's what we use for designing condor banks. I'm not going to get into that too much, but we use different levels. And if you see, you got 0.03, which is bare cultivated channel, to 0.15, which is standing wheat stubble. So when we look at the, if we change, I mean, like I said before, the condor banks were designed for being bare earth. So they were not designed for having any stubble in them. We then grow, grow wheat in them. And if you jump right over to the right hand side there, it says predicted capacity in cubic meters a second, which is the amount of water vo uh, volume that's going out. So it's a cross sectional area times the velocity gives us how much cubic meters of water is going out per second. Have a look at the numbers. From bare earth, we're nearly doing three cubic meters a second to wheat stubble 0.6. So that's a five times essentially reduction in, it's now six fives of 30. So like an 80% reduction in the capacity of that channel, all because we put standing wheat stubble in it. 
So we need to build our banks bigger. We need to even sneak up the the um, uh, the contour bank channel grades uh, even more because those velocities there um, we can still handle. Um, so that's why we we've, we've been pushing quite hard to, to increase the, the the size of the banks and 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 maybe sneak up the the um, the channel grades just a little bit just so that you can get rid of that water um, safely. But also you might have to design this too for a bare earth situation because sometimes you might have cultivated for feather top and it's bare earth. So, you know, we've got to, we've got to be able to manage a range of situations. And again, this is a design for a one in 10 year event. Um, there's a couple of ways we can, do uh, Condor Bank work too. Um, there's a lot of software. I might just jump to the software first. There's new software available to help you design Condor Bank's channels and waterways. Uh, probably the best one on the market is the Terracutta solution from, uh, it works with iGrade, John Deere solution. You can actually, um, you can plan out a whole heap of Condor Banks before you start. Um, and then you can implement those with your iGrade. Um, Trimble have a thing called OptiSurf, or Trimble don't own OptiSurface, but it works really well with OptiSurface. It's that program I showed before. Um, Topcon have AgForm 3D. FarmScan in Toowoomba have a thing called Level Guide. AgLeader has a thing called IntelliSlope. And these, these later ones are more for fixing up bank channels um, or putting them in. Uh, there's, uh, forget the 3D data guidance. And there's also a thing called Ditch Assist, which can use any GPS system on uh, to control a bucket to or or a or a ditcher to actually you know clean out all your condor bank channels. All you have to do is basically drive the channel, put the tolerances in, and redrive it, and it will cut and fill automatically. So I guess what I'm saying is there's a whole heap of good solutions out there now that you can get commercially, do it yourself, or get someone to help you. But I guess the biggest consideration too is is about considering your neighbours and, and, and the landscape, not just the paddock you're working in. And that's what a lot of these programs won't help you with, but that's where you need to get some professional advice to help with where do I put Condor Banks waterways in, in the landscape. So I'll just jump back. To, that's that's the software that's that, that I'm aware of. There's probably more. Um, but, you know, when I talked about cutting drains before, a grader could do that or a, or a bucket. Um, as you can see in the bottom there. But I think there's great options for things like this Wolverine Ditcher, which is on the bottom left there. It will cut, it'll be GPS controlled. So it knows what height it's cutting at and will spit that dirt back into the field. I reckon it's a great idea for building channels. It's a great idea for building, uh, cleaning out waterways, uh, cleaning out condor bank channels. Um, and these things are commercially available now. They've, I've seen them working really well around uh, Queensland. They're doing some demos in CQ. So um, yeah, get in touch with the guys that sell those and uh, you know, really good option for cleaning out condor bank channels, a very cost-effective way of doing it. Um, I've seen a lot of great laser bucket finish jobs um, where you, you, know, you get a really nice finish. It's fully compacted um, and it's ready to go. And ready to plant through so you might do the bulk earthworks with the dozer but finishing them off the laser bucket you know, does a really really nice job um just a final slide on condor bank gradients um generally it's to do with the land slope and most of your country in cq is on about two percent slope so that's why most people recommend about a 20 centimeter drop or 0.2 percent, so that's 20 centimeter drop in a 100 meters. That's the same as 0 0.2. Um, I would probably start with 0 0.2 and sneak it up a little bit more at the outlet section, um, if I if it was me. Um, and as you, you can see there, as you get steeper and steeper slopes, you can increase those grades quite a bit. Um, but yeah, most of your country, I would be starting around about that 0 0.2 to 0 0.25. So this is um, the, the one question that came through before was about how do we 
how do you manage the ends of the contour bank channels? And I think I'll I'll cover off that in the next next little bit. Um, a lot of I will say one thing though. There was a stage where soil conservationists uh, from the government were turning the condor ends of the condor bank channels up, so less grade, allowing them to slow down before they got to the, the condor bank. The, all that did was lead to silting up in the ends of the contour channels, and they busted over about 50 metres back from the from the waterway. Then there was a trend to turn the ends of the condor channels down, and I've measured some condor bank ends that were around about one percent. So they sort of went a bit extreme and caused the big gutters to form at the end of the condor bank channels. So the, 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 the final advice really is to, is to survey the, the condor bank channel right to the bottom of the waterway, um, which is fine, um, except where you have very large drops in waterways. And the, the, there's no other way around that except to put rock in there um, and, and allowing that to drop. I mean, you could put engineering structures, but that's going to be very expensive. So yeah, I think, uh, look, look at the ends of your condor bank channels and if they're washing out, then I, su I suggest they probably turn the end down and increase the grade to get that water to flow away. Uh, you, you could re, re change those back to a normal condor bank channel grade, like a 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Um, or, uh, put rock in them to stop them from eating up into the paddock, which is what happens 90% of the time because your waterways wash out down to bedrock and then you've got this sort of one and a half metre drop and that's where the problems occur. We'll jump over and do some um, real life examples. <laughs> 